After letting my thoughts marinate for the past two weeks, I am finally here to talk to all of you good people about Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. What a movie, and I know, I know, Marvel fanboy thinks the movie is great? Duh. But no, seriously guys, it was amazing. Now, I would be lying if I said I didn't have my doubts going into the film. When it was first announced that it was going to be made and focus on the people of Wakanda, I was highly skeptical and worried based on how it sounded and thought it could be somewhat distasteful after losing Chadwick Boseman. However, today I am very happy to say that I was proven wrong. Not jumping into any spoilers yet, but when I said that the sadness of this movie was overbearing in my last video, I meant it, and it was apparent as soon as the movie started. I want Ryan Coogler to get all of the awards possible because he achieved a titanic feat with this one. I'd also like to note that one of my favorite parts of this movie was the usage of silence. There were a lot of important moments where there was no music and it felt perfect for the atmosphere. Additionally, the various shots of the movie that we see were beautiful, and one of the things I've appreciated most with Phase 4 of the MCU has been the vibrance of most of its projects. Even if you remove the superhero Marvel aspects of the film, you still have a story that conveys the beauty and devastation of grief. Every member of the cast carried their weight and really brought their characters to life, but Angela Bassett, Letitia Wright, and Teno Chuerta really stole the show for me. Great themes, messages, and concepts overall. A sequel done right if you ask me. Namor's Introduction Wow, I didn't think there would be a horror aspect to this film, but there it was. I feel like he was a perfect antagonist. I also think they translated him extremely well from the comics to the big screen, and his writing made this especially ring true. But my enemies call me Namor. Hollow Khan was beautiful, and I never thought that I'd see a salute that made me smile as much as Wakanda's, but there I was. Namor quickly became one of my favorite MCU characters, and the change of his roots to base them more in the real world was one of this movie's major pluses. Opportunity to, to bring this ancient sculpture, our, our roots, our heritage as yeah. Latin Americans, it's fantastic. He's felt like the best antagonist in a while to me, and has had me calling myself Kul Kul Khan for the last two weeks. Queen Ramonda. When I tell you I felt like I was being stripped of my title watching that scene. Some of the best acting I've watched, let alone from the MCU. Her story over the course of the film was great, and I enjoyed the parallel that she provided to Shuri's grief, despite trying to teach her to try to get through it on her own. Shuri's progression throughout this film was amazing. Although I knew deep down this wasn't true, but prior to this film, she felt pretty one-dimensional to me. Throughout all of the grief and hardships, we were really given a chance to not only get a better understanding of Shuri, but also really grasp the scope of all of her misery. It was easy for her to unleash all of the anger and hurt and vengeance upon Namor during their final encounter, but she didn't. Killmonger's return within Shuri's ancestral plane was great because it showed us that she doesn't automatically follow in the footsteps of her late brother and father, and that she really is her own person who takes influence from all three. At first, I was iffy about Riri Williams' inclusion, but I think she fit with the whole film pretty well. I enjoyed Dominique Thorne's performance and the fact that she just felt natural, not trying too hard to be the comedic relief for anything other than a good addition to this movie's cast. I smiled every time there was some kind of Iron Man callback, and I really do look forward to seeing more of her in her series. The one con that I see a lot of people having an issue with was the Everett Ross and Val storyline. Personally, I had no problem with it. It was subtle world building that I feel wasn't too in your face, but I can understand if it felt like it stalled the pacing of the movie at times. I only wish that we could have had more of Nakia and M'Baku in the film since they've become two of my favorite characters in the MCU. And that mid credit scene, huh? I want to kick myself to stop using the word beautiful so much when discussing, but the reality is that really is the best way to describe this movie. thought it was a really poetic and great way to not only preserve the character of T'Challa, but serve as an ode to Chadwick too. I honestly think that you have to do a lot of nitpicking to find bad parts about the film. Personally, there were one or two details I didn't like that are so minute, I would have to really mull over them to let the whole film be ruined for me. After I got home from the theater, I hopped on a call with a friend, and did a tier list, and we both saw how this movie hopped up all the way into our MCU top 5. Great work from everyone involved in this project, and a much needed boost in the soul and passion for the MCU to end this phase. Now you're probably asking yourself, why is this video still running? Well, as I sat down alone in my room really thinking about this movie, I said to myself, hey, that was a good sequel, but how does it compare to some other well-known ones? Well, I ultimately came down to two. And those are Toy Story 2 and Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2. Pizza time. To put it simply, these were two out of what I'm sure are many great sequels, but after watching Wakanda Forever, these two were the first to come to mind, and I don't think there wasn't a reason for it. 
Spider-Man 2, a film that many hail as not only the greatest movie in Raimi's trilogy, but the best out of all live-action iterations of Spidey. While it is technically an MCU film now because of the wonders of the multiverse, Spider-Man 2 came to mind because it tells a similar story to Wakanda Forever, and simply does so coming from another era. 18 years marks the difference between these films, and yet they both tell us stories of our heroes being brought to their knees because of the strife and pain they endure. I feel like these two embody translating the comics to the big screen in some of the best ways. We even see both of our heroes ditched their alter egos, but when they realize that there is just too much at stake with them on the sidelines, they find themselves with a reinvigorated sense of responsibility and embrace being protectors. Along with our heroes' journeys, our antagonists were both wronged by the world and seeking vengeance against those who crossed them. Which brings me to our other sequel. Now how the hell does Black Panther Wakanda Forever relate to Toy Story 2 in any way? Well my friends, when I really thought about it, I think I struck gold. Now. Imagine I tell you about a story where our main protagonist is already tackling their own personal woes, and suddenly, they've been swept away to a place that was not only distant, but also leads them to learn that their lives and some of the things that they knew were not as they thought. Oh, and on top of that, are met with an antagonistic force that loathes the outside world that didn't accept them. See, they aren't that different. Woody, Shuri, and Peter all encounter a kind of conflict and journey that ties them all together, and this is why they find themselves within the pantheon of some of the best sequels that are in the ethos of cinema. Wakanda Forever was a great and much needed cherry on top of what was the somewhat expired Sunday that is phase 4 of the MCU, and another example of how to write a sequel.